couple of interesting Formula One and junior single seat stories. Um, some photographs, I... It was like, wow. Photographing Sir Jackie Stewart, talking with Paul Stewart about those early team principal meetings, how he viewed Ron Dennis, Frank Williams, Jordan Bray, Tory Walking Show, how he's proud of the team from Milton Keynes, now known as Red Bull Racing. Because going back a couple of years now, I had the privilege of interviewing Paul Stewart and photographing Sir Jackie Stewart at Silverstone when they launched Race Against Dementia, a global charity that he aims to take F1 style thinking into the scientific fight to find a cure for the condition. If you can support the charity, the link's in the description. Uh, the upcoming audio of the interview delivered some interesting stories for fans of 90s Formula One. I've overlaid some footage of Sir Jackie getting back in his 1969 championship winning Matra with some photos from the day and to fill it out, some Creative Commons licensed photos relating to it all. Have a listen, a watch, like, comment, subscribe. Cheers. Oh god, okay, what car I've never seen here that I'd like to see here. Um, uh, that I've never seen here I'd like to see here. God. That's a curveball. Uh, uh, a Stuart Grand Prix car. <laughs> but that's not historic enough. <laughs> probably that'd be a, a Stuart Ford yeah. SF1 2. No, not a 2, an SF1 or SF3, probably. Yeah. I suppose a Stuart Grand Prix car would be the one that uh -huh. I think. I've sort of been like, bloody hell, that's great. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So any one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, a question I was going to leave for later on, but I'll, I'll bring things to Stuart Grand Prix. Do you feel any connection to Red Bull in terms of? You know their success directly. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I feel I, I feel connection very much so, but not not in a way of of, of claiming any any you know yeah. trumpeting rights. Just the fact I'm proud that you know the, the, the seeds of the of, you know what we created as Short Grand Prix ultimately yeah. um, has has uh, has allowed Red Bull to, to, you know to be to, to be where it is and yeah. you know. You're choosing Milton Keynes, and and uh, and uh, you know, then the fact that say that they're still in Milton Keynes, I love it. Yeah. When I see the other world, then the the, 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 the Milton Keynes outfit or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's quite, I think it's it's quite it's quite you know when you know you've made a decision or something yeah. like that. It's quite. So I'm, you know, I, I love it, and I wish them even more success as yeah. they go on. But I don't want to take any claim of any of it. But I but it does make me feel. Uh, you know, feel proud and and, and, and very happy for, for them. Yeah, do a great, amazing job. And, uh, Stuart, um, obviously with the Formula Three team, you developed quite a number of drivers who went on to very high levels of success over in yeah. the car Formula and whatnot. And it was a fantastic gateway, um, especially in the British Formula Three Championship, with the way that the development series have changed over the last 10 to 20 years and how the likes of British Formula 3 and European series are yeah. outside the FIA kind of yeah. triangle and ladder success. Yeah. Do you think that that's a good or a bad thing? I, I think it's, it, it's somewhat, it's a bit it's more, it's a bit confusing for some, yeah. for the general for people to understand, you know, who's the young star coming through. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I wouldn't want to hark on about you know the past, the past all the time. You know you, yeah. you 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 evolve and and and, and you know the, the commercial realities are the things that that, yeah. that sort of uh, and if it doesn't work financially, it it's, we live in a we've chosen to live in a free society, yeah. and um, things sort of fade away. But um, and you know I, it, it certainly in particular Formula Three was a great barometer of drivers so if you knew that the guy had been the Italian Formula 3 champion, the French Formula 3 championship French champion or the British and traditionally I think, sorry this might make you some noise but, um, tradition, you know, the, I guess the British was kind of, because there's more Formula 1 teams they, you know, they picked more drivers that came out of it so yeah. you couldn't become a Formula 1 driver without having raced no, in 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 Formula Three, but if you'd been if you'd won the British Formula Three Championship, it was a shoe in to 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 to, to becoming a Formula One driver. And I think that that's somewhat a bit more confusing nowadays. And you know, if you and also maybe the, the money and everything else has got so large. But I mean, if you win the F two Championship, it doesn't guarantee your place in Formula One the following year. Um, it gives you a, a great chance of it. Um, but if there's no spaces there. 
you know, it's just the team's not going to risk it. Whereas I think people would say, former British, former three times chip, you would, yeah, I'm not letting this guy go. Um, I'm, you know, somehow going to tie him up in one way or the other. Or, you know. when, when you were in F3, and obviously you had managing two drivers or, or more drivers in the entire racing spectrum. Were you ever in a situation where one driver dominated another driver and you had to step in and try and reignite some of that passion? Yeah, I, I, certainly, um, I, I wouldn't say, I would say generally if a driver was was not feeling, I, I'd learnt a lot through myself as a driver and also through the drivers, the other, you know, the watching and, and how to sort of to try and make them feel loved or make them feel something wasn't happening right or sometimes it was it was it was uh, the fathers getting in, involved for all the right reasons and um, and and dealing with that in a way that was that was you know that was appropriate yeah. because at the end of the day you want your team to be successful and if you're not if the driver leaves unhappy and um, you know you, you don't want that to blemish your uh, I mean I, for example Ralph Furman when he was racing um, for us successfully and had a, had a great relationship there was a period when he was Ralph was strong his father was not happy with the way things were happening and all the rest of it and um, you know I, I, I you know it, it, Obviously, I, Ralph's a great friend nowadays, and so you know I was able. To, maybe I played a part in you know a sort of the issue that he might have had an issue, which might yeah. have been perceived or real, and working that out. But and even in Formula One, you know, when I was uh, working with the drivers there, I mean, I remember you know how to Rubens was was one I, I in particular when Rubens had moments of wasn't happy about certain things, you know, again, perceived or, or or real, you know, it's a certain skill to sort of put your arm around them and say, right, what can we do, let's sort this out, what do you need, and working it out, and then I'm coming out, right, and, saying, and then wax it, you know, up the front end of the grid, in our case, you know, and you think that, yeah. very rewarding, and it's part of the job, you know, I mean, imagine what, ultimate one, imagine what Ron Dennis had to do with Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost. You know, I mean, you know, we were, it was Charles play, what we yeah. were doing, I mean, it was, it was, but, you know, when you start dealing with that, or, or Mansell and Piquet, you know, Williams, you know, um, you know, so, so it's, it's part of the fun, really. That step up into F1 for you, did, was, it, was it intimidating as a, you know, being in, running a team and coming up against people like Ron Dennison, dealing with... In Formula, Mosley, you know, yeah, in Formula One, that the, when, when you first stepped up, was it, or, or did you feel comfortable? Um, you know, I think intimidating, probably not, because we were just so focused and driven by what we were trying to achieve that, you know, we couldn't be intimidated. There was yeah. no room for intimidation. Yeah. It was like, we're doing the best job that we can possibly do given our resources, and we're going to put as much energy in for So the whole factory, the whole, the, you know, everyone in the, in the, in the team was so... Um, I remember our first Grand Prix in Australia, um, and well, I remember many of them well, but, but in particular it was the first Grand Prix and I was at, in the pits, and uh, Ron Dennis came down to have a look at our garage, Yeah. and I was like, and I knew Ron, and but I was, you know, I was, I, 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 I was very, I was very proud that you yeah. took the time to come down and actually what, see what these guys have done okay you know and with his critical eye and um, yeah I thought that was rather it was um, uh, yeah so the intimidation no but but feeling like you're you're in with the big boys you know yeah but you've got to yeah, I mean it, and it was not just about racing it was so much more it was about the business side of it the you know, sitting on team principal meetings. I suppose that could have been intimidating. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was alluding to. Like, so I guess so politics. now. You know, and I think through it. You know, sit at a table and you'd, at, you know, at Heathrow Terminal Four, where you'd have the team principals meetings, and you'd, I'd make sure I was there early because I wasn't damned if I was going to be the kid that walks in late. <laughs> but you, you they get there and you'd sit down, and then you know, Tom Walker show would arrive. Um, you know, and with all his success and reputation and everything, and then. 
Ron would arrive with his all his files and pro properly prepared and ready for the meeting. Um, you know, Eddie Jordan would arrive with his sort of with, with his bag of sweets and a pencil stuck behind his ear or something like that. And Flavio would arrive with all his phones laid out in front of him. And and uh, and then you know Frank Williams would arrive on his wheelchair and then lift up and be doing he's been making do his exercise. Yes. Yeah. You know, and then. Uh, and then Alan Frost, or as it was, Frost walks in to do his thing. See, the thing, before you run the table, with whatever we were, 20, you know, I don't know, maybe not 20, we were, we were, we were 10 teams, it was 10 plus, you know, 15 call of it. They were just, yeah. you know, and then you're waiting. And then Max Mosley and Bernie Eccleston walk in. It's like, if you understand racing, yeah. you think, so yes, intimidating possibly <laughs> under those <laughs> circumstances. So I, I, I take back what I said. I was thinking more of a performance point of view, but that, yeah. those are the things that were possibly into. But you couldn't allow yourself to be intimidated. Yeah. yeah. I had to raise my hand once, and I mean, you know, because the meeting started off, and uh, there was the thing about prize money, and I was got a piece of paper saying I'd, there was zero on it or something like that to do with something, and I said. And I thought, oh, shit, <laughs> this is not right, you know. I just sort of put my hand up and say, excuse me, you know, yeah. there's a problem here, you know. <laughs> and uh, and it was like, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, okay. No. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, well, it's, it's funny even talking. I don't talk about these things, yeah. really. And uh, it's funny sitting here, you know, yeah, just reminiscing and <laughs> memories coming back, yeah. But going back to the... Um like the the drive and the passion. Um, did you feel when you made the decision to quit driving? Yeah. How did that feel in terms of to stop driving? You mean? Yeah, to, to, to stop drive, to stop racing. Um, yeah. Did did it feel? Ob obviously, you had the, the the team was already up and running. You had that to, to fill that void. But as a driver, what was it that to stop racing? Uh, yeah. What was the, what was the final? It was, you know, the, the, it was my decision. That was the main thing. Yeah. So I never, I never ever regretted it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I combination of things. One, you know, my father stopped racing. He would made a decision to stop, and I always remember that as a child yeah. growing up. And I also remember all these drivers getting killed, and so I yeah. understood yeah. very clearly why he stopped. Um, but when I had, let's call it limited success, yeah. you know, I mean, I was races, I was on it and quick and, and everything else you know whether it was just talking before I mean, I've talked about qualifying third in Macau against Schumacher and all yeah. these behind me and everyone else and other races where I was you know battling with Hacken and, and, and all that kind of but I didn't have enough success to justify me saying presenting myself the Formula 1 thing saying here I am I'm ready for you guys yeah. and um, you know I started at 21 so by then I was whatever it was um, you know, 27, 27 20 28, 28, 28 yeah. around there, and uh, so I just, you know, I was being realistic. I said, well, you know, I've got to think my life here. I could become a Formula One driver. I don't think that would have been too difficult. Mm -hmm. But then, actually, carrying on and making uh, and competing at that level, uh, it's supposed you know, to be being in there. Not being yeah, yeah. sort of seen as being, um, you know, if I hadn't delivered. It, you know, it was a bit more of a target at my back by no. virtue of the family connection. But I also knew that, uh, you know, I, always, I, was did, I was wanted to be successful and, and ambitious, and the racing team, Pulsuit Racing, was the platform for that. Yeah. Perfect platform for it. So I made a choice. So I never missed it. 